Over 90% of serial killers are white males, usually from low to middle class backgrounds. These men are usually intelligent, but as students have difficulty focusing, most experience the traumatic childhood, often having been abused psychologically, physically, or sexually. Typically, they may be raised in unstable families, often with criminal psychiatric and alcoholic histories. Raised in such families, these children tend to spend much time on their own, and as a result, many practiced animal cruelty at a young age. Sometimes where, uh, you know, you might not have extreme forms of physical abuse, there is always some kind of extreme emotional or psychological abuse that these young children are subjected to, which really warps them out of shape. I mean, in one way or another, they come to associate the infliction of pain with pleasure. For example, John Wayne Gacy had an alcoholic father who often beat him. John Sr. would frequently insult the child, practically eliminating his self-confidence, which led to later difficulties John Jr. would have with his masculinity. As an adult, John began to rape and kill, eventually burying 29 bodies in a crawl space under his house. As Gacy was quite popular in his community, his neighbors couldn't believe that John was capable of such atrocities. Most people who suffer as children grow out of it and become upstanding, decent human beings. But serial killers who've suffered as children repeat the same mistakes over the course of their lives. They can't make the transition into adulthood. They have trouble making the transition in middle age. And, the, and at the very time in their lives when they feel they should be reaching the pinnacle of success, they find that they're sliding downhill fast. They want to feel important. They want to feel special. They, they, they crave the sense of power and dominance and control, but they simply can't achieve it in any respectable way. And so they kill and they torture and they sodomize and dismember, and that makes them feel good about themselves. Ted Bundy was born into poverty and never knew his father. He had good grades in school, but an unmanageable temper. At the age of 16, he became a voyeur obsessed with masturbating. Who would have known that Bundy would become a serial murderer, and yet he killed many women? Many Americans, when they think of a serial killer, will think of a glassy-eyed lunatic, a monster, someone who acts that way, someone who, who looks that way. And yet the typical serial killer is extraordinarily ordinary. He's a white, middle-aged man who has an insatiable appetite for power, control, and dominance. And he kills not for money or revenge, but because it makes him feel good, because he enjoys it, because he has fun with it. He likes the thrill, the excitement, the exhilaration that he gets from squeezing the last gasp of breath from his dying victim's body. He enjoys the suffering on the part of the victim, and he tries to make it slow and painful. It makes him feel superior to the extent that he makes his victim inferior. Gacy maintained a facade of respectability. He maintained a business, a family, uh, uh, married with several children, and uh, that facade was uh, sufficient to uh, cover his tracks for many, many years. He enjoyed dressing up in a clown suit and clowning. He said that clowns can get away with murder. 
eventually his wife left him. His business started failing, and uh, at that point, Gacy was caught, uh, arrested, convicted, and uh, after, again, three appeals in his case, uh, Gacy was executed. With 5% of the world's population, the United States produces more serial killers than the rest of the world, accounting for 76% of the national total. Europe produces the second most serial killers, 17%. England leads European countries, 28%, followed by Germany at 27%. California has the highest number of serial homicide cases in the United States, while New York, Texas, Illinois follow closely behind. Maine has the lowest number of serial homicide cases in the United States, and statistics reveal that 65% of serial killer victims are women. A lady killer with a bloodlust and a temper out of control. In his 42 years, Bundy killed approximately 36 young women. No one really knows exactly how many he killed. Although once a police officer asked Bundy in shock how one person could kill 36 women, Bundy shook his head and said, add one digit to that and you'll have it. There are at most about 200 victims of serial killers a year. And that number, although very large, pales by comparison with the almost 18,000 single victim murders in the United States on a yearly basis. Uh, the problem in this country is not serial murder, it's domestic violence, it's workplace homicide, it's two guys going into a bar, one takes out a gun and shoots the other. The problem, on the other hand, is that serial murderers amass a large body count. We are talking about a very small number of guys who do a lot of damage. You know, they may kill five or ten or, or even twenty or more. Some of them have killed hundreds. That is enough to terrify uh, most of the people in the country. A cannibal is a person who eats human flesh. There is much discussion as to whether cannibalism is an inherent characteristic in all human beings, our animal impulses, or whether cannibalism stems only from the minds of mad beasts, such as some of the most prolific serial killers. Cannibalism is the ultimate form of aggression. Uh, there are tribes around the world who have incorporated cannibalism into warfare. So they achieve an ultimate victory, not only by killing their enemy, but also by devouring his remains. Serial killers, like Andrei Chikatilo, have also incorporated sadism into their warfare. Uh, they have, uh, in the most sadistic possible way, cannibalized their victims by eating their hearts or their eyes or their genitalia in an effort to achieve ultimate pain and suffering on the part of the victim. It's this sadistic impulse that, that feeds the frail and fragile ego of a serial killer who desires so much, so desperately, to achieve a sense of power over other human beings. And cannibalism is the means whereby that happens. Anthropological evidence seems to suggest that um, you know, cannibalism was a kind of activity that our pre-human uh, ancestors indulged in with a certain amount of regularity. So I think that there probably is some innate impulse towards that kind of activity. And one of the things that you see with serial killers, I believe, is that, um, that uh, <sighs> They kind of, again, act out very, very archaic, primitive impulses that clearly still exist on some very, very deep level. Cannibalism, so you'll hear from these mentally ill, psychotic types that, uh, that they're consuming their uh, victim to, to make their victim part of them so that they can, cons that can uh, keep them and have them always. Any uh, serial killer who resorts to cannibalism is doing so as a last resort, out of desperation. Certainly, uh, whether it's for sadism or affection, uh, 
any serial killer who cannibalizes victims is uh, has 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 broken one of the most pervasive and profound taboos in all of society. Psychologically, this means that the killer uh, achieves just the opposite uh, of what he had hoped. He may get a temporary rush. He may feel temporarily high. But in terms of his ego, in terms of self-image, he has got to feel worse about himself than he has before. Uh, on the other hand, once he has cannibalized, anything goes. As cannibalism may have stemmed from the days of our primitive ancestors, modern-day crime reveals a few of time's most prolific serial killers as cannibals. In 1968, the silver screen immortalized flesh-eating zombies roaming the hills of Pennsylvania in search of a good snack in George A. Romero's Dead Trilogy. These films seemed a mere footnote to the madness and turbulence that had played out in real life during a most murderous decade. The 60s. Now is the time. Out of Vietnam. Six years later, chainsaws and cannibal family values were brought to the screen in Toby Hooper's surreal cult thriller, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. There's a sense in which these are our versions of what scholars call wonder tales. You know, these are stories that fill us with a sense of the marvelous and the, you know, sort of deliciously terrifying. People love to hear stories like that. And, you know, these kinds of Hollywood horror movies are our versions of those kind of age-old tales of wonder and terror and uh, adventure and so on and so forth. And, you know, the confrontation with these mythic monsters that have always populated these kinds of stories. It is so extraordinary, so terrifying, so hideous, that it might as well be fiction. Uh, most people don't see much of a difference between Hannibal Lecter, who was actually a figment of Thomas Harris's imagination in the film Silence of the Lambs, and Jeffrey Dahmer, who was a real-life, flesh-and-blood serial murderer. To the average person, there is no difference between fact and fantasy. Uh, the more extraordinary, the more hideous, the more we fictionalize these people so that they can become entertaining, so that they're fun. After all, muggings are not at all entertainment for most people because they happen too often to anybody. But serial murder, that seems out of the question for most people. Hannibal the Cannibal Lecter has captured the imagination of the nation. The Silence of the Lambs, a novel by Thomas Harris, was adapted for the screen in 1991, in which Lecter played doctor to millions of riveted moviegoers perhaps cinema's guiltiest pleasure since Norman Bates. The figure of Hannibal Lecter as, as he's portrayed on the screen is uh, not really an accurate, accurate portrayal of a serial killer. Uh, first of all, I know of no uh, serial killer that was uh, ever a psychiatrist. Uh, I know of some medical doctors who have uh, taken a number of lives. Uh, but not in the fashion, not in the perverse fashion of Hannibal Lecter. I know of no um, person of his caliber high up in society that was a cannibal or who that uh, was so uh, well integrated into the upper levels of, of uh, society and yet at the same time such a diabolically uh, deranged individual. And of course what, what uh, Harris did here is just combine the organized and the disorganized personalities into one mixed bag, which really doesn't exist in real life. We kind of want to believe, and I think this is the meaning of, of Hannibal, is that the serial killer is a kind of a, to some degree, a bit of a Nietzschean Superman, that he's more clever, more intelligent, um, more cagey than nearly anyone, except the one person who, in the end, of course, will capture him. Uh, and even in the case of Hannibal, there's a certain elegance imparted to him, although in some ways it only makes him more terrifying. But it is part of the myth of the serial killer, at least as it's now being um, elaborated, that the serial killer is more, bigger than life. There's something weirdly asexual about Hannibal Lecter. You know, his motivations don't seem to be sexual at all. His desire to kill and devour other people. 
Uh, that's a very, very interesting aspect of his character. Ryoma seems to be above that. I mean, it's another thing that makes him seem not quite human and really larger than life in some way. He doesn't seem to be at the mercy of these perverse sexual needs, whereas somebody like uh, Fish or Dom or any of these people, you know, they really, really are. Long before Hannibal Lecter, fictional cannibal, there was a man the tabloids labeled both the gray man and the werewolf of Wisteria. He was a true life cannibal, a living monster. <laughs> Born into a respectable family in Washington, D.C. in 1870, Albert Fish's immediate family had a history of mental illness and alcoholism. A few of his relatives had perished in mental institutions. At the age of five, Fish's father died. His mother was forced to work and was unable to care for him. So Fish was sent to an orphanage. Here, Fish recalls, I saw so many boys whipped, it took root in my head. Fish became a painter and decorator eventually marrying for 20 years and fathering six children. But when his wife left him for another man, leaving Fish to raise the children alone, he began to dangerously unravel, his madness fueled by a growing interest in cannibalism and religion. Fish began to indulge in raw meat at dinner, often serving it to his children, who would later testify he would do this on nights when the moon was full. Though he was said to never have physically abused his children, he did encourage them and their friends to pound his buttocks with a self-made paddle studded with inch-long nails. There was a period of his life where he went off to Europe and apparently spent a lot of time in these male brothels. I think he was probably um, a, a male prostitute himself and indulged in all kinds of sadomasochistic homosexual stuff. In New York City on May 28, 1928, 58-year-old Albert Fish responded to an ad placed in the New York World Classifieds by an 18-year-old boy named Edward Budd. The young boy was seeking employment. Fish, a house painter, a deeply religious man, and father of six, paid a visit to the Budd family at 406 West 15th Street under the pretense of hiring Edward to work on his farmland upstate. On the day Fish appeared at the Budd residence for the first time, he stood bearing strawberries and pot cheese from a German deli. He appeared to be a kind, gracious man, white-haired, slightly feeble, and even genteel. Fish is regarded by many aficionados of crime as uh, the scariest uh, and most deranged of all American serial killers. Partly, I think it was because he was so, he seemed so benign. Uh, at the time of his arrest, he was this old, grandfatherly-looking guy. I mean, seemingly very, very benign and harmless, sort of stoop-shouldered and grizzled. But he was an incredibly demented child murderer, torturer, who had spent really his whole life preying on young children. Fish could have easily passed for someone's grandfather. But this was not your average grandfather. Edward Budd was thrilled at the prospect of summer employment with the affable old-timer and Fish quickly earned the trust of Albert and Delia Budd. Once Fish laid eyes on 12-year-old Grace Budd, he had a diabolical change of his ghoulish heart. Enchanted by the small girl, Fish quickly switched gears and promised Edward that he would return in a few days to bring him to the farmhouse. Fish then insisted on taking Grace along to his niece's birthday party later that night. The Buds, reluctant at first, finally decided to allow Grace to go along with Fish they would never see their daughter alive again. In 1930, Grace Budd's abduction had still gone unsolved. Over time, Fish developed an obsession with writing obscene letters to widows, responding to advertisements in both personal and matrimonial agencies. But he wasn't your average gentleman caller. Fish wasn't interested in dinner and a movie. He asked the women if they would like to beat him or join him in whipping small boys. Fish underwent psychiatric evaluations off and on throughout his lifetime. Doctors would later diagnose Fish as having an abnormal psychopathic personality with a hint of early senility, but he wasn't considered to be insane. It would be four more years before the whereabouts of Grace Bud would be discovered. The case was resolved because of one last haunting letter scribed by Fish, but this letter was not intended for a lonely widower. It was sent to Albert and Delia Bud whom knew a loneliness of a much darker strain. 
The letter read, My dear Mrs. Budd, I call on you at 406 West 15th Street. Brought you pot cheese, strawberries. We had lunch. Grace sat in my lap and kissed me. I made up my mind to eat her on the pretense of taking her to a party. You said yes, she could go. I took her to an empty house in Westchester I had already picked out. When we got there, I told her to remain outside. She picked wildflowers. I went upstairs and stripped all my clothes off. I knew if I did not, I would get her blood on them. When all was ready, I went to the window and called her. Then I hid in a closet until she was in the room. When she saw me all naked, she began to cry and tried to run downstairs. I grabbed her and she said she would tell her mama. First I stripped her naked. How she did kick, bite and scratch. I choked her to death, then cut her in small pieces so I could take my meat to my rooms, cook and eat it. How sweet and tender her little ass was roasted in the oven. It took me nine days to eat her entire body. I did not fuck her, though I could have had I wished. She died a virgin. After dismembering her body, most of which she left behind in a closet, Fish would carry a portion of flesh by train to his house in the city, where he stewed the flesh with onions and carrots, deriving sexual pleasure as he consumed her. Fish's letter from hell was unsigned, but police were able to discern the letter's distinctive stationery. At the time, Fish was living in a rooming house. Police tracked him down and arrested him. Among the materials found in his possession were old newspaper clippings about Fritz Harman, the German vampire who had killed young men before selling their flesh in the marketplace. An outraged policeman asked Fish about his cannibalization of Grace Bud. It occurred to me, Fish replied. Fish's story and Fish himself seemed to be like the flesh and blood incarnation of all of these kinds of fairy tale monsters that you, uh, you know, are so fascinated and terrified and titillated by when you're a child. You know, the uh, again, the, the har you know, it's like the witch in Hansel and Gretel or something. You know, the seemingly harmless old person who offers you candy and then turns out to be a cannibal. So there's something, you know, there's something very, very fascinating when you see one of these mythic monsters sort of step off the pages of the Grimm brothers and inhabit the real world. Fish was charged with the murder of Grace Bud. He also confessed to at least 100 other incidents. I've had children in every state, Fish teased. He was sentenced to die in the electric chair at Sing Sing. On January 16, 1936, Fish ate his last meals. For lunch, he ate a T-bone steak. For dinner, he had a roast chicken, but he barely touched it. Later that night, after a six-year manhunt, the state of New York finally put an end to Fish's unspeakable appetites by executing him in the electric chair. Fish had even been looking forward to his electrocution. It'll be the supreme thrill, the only one I haven't tried, he exclaimed. But even Fish's execution didn't come off easy. When he was in jail, he began complaining that he was having this difficulty sitting and so on and so forth. And, and when the, when the uh, prison physicians came to talk to him about it, he, he said that one form of pleasure that he got was inserting needles uh, up between his legs into his perineum and leaving them lodged inside his lower body. And of course, nobody believed this was the case. And they x-rayed him. And in fact, they found, when the x-rays were developed, they found there were the 27 needles of varying sizes that were shoved up into his pelvic region. This was just one of many forms of incredibly masochistic behavior that Fish indulged in. You know, he was a, a masochist and a sadist, uh, a, a classic case of someone for whom pleasure and pain are completely inseparable. During the electrocution, all of the metal in his body caused a short circuit during the first shock. It took two massive jolts of electricity to kill him. At age 65, Fish was the oldest man ever executed at Sing Sing. So 50 years before America's favorite cinematic carnivore, Hannibal Lecter, there was Albert Fish, house painter, father of six, and cannibal.
In the 1970s, Soviet state authorities would dismiss any idea of serial murderers, and all in the good name of communism. But lurking among them was a man who would become the most prolific serial murderer in modern history. Andrei Romanovich Shikatilo was born in the Ukraine during a time of post-war famine. At the age of five, his mother recounted that prior to his birth, his older brother had wandered too far from home and was later cannibalized by starving villagers. Chikatilo had a, what we would call a tough life. But by Soviet standards, there was nothing particularly tough about his life. Uh, he saw some terrible things because he, he lived through the period of the uh, Nazi invasion of Ukraine. Uh, he lived in the, in the country that was ruled by Joseph Stalin in which tens of millions of people were being executed, sent to the gulag, dying on the way to the gulag, dying in the gulag. People were dying by the millions. The Russians lost 27 million people in total in World War II. So it was a place of death and a place of war and a place of terror. But that was true for everyone. It wasn't uniquely true for Chikatilo in any way. Many people would come out in the morning and see dead bodies on the street with the buttocks sliced off because that was the last meaty part of the body. And a little girl on her way to school would, would see that. And it's a horrifying sight. And every Russian family, if you talk to them long enough, will end up remembering one story or another connected with cannibalism. The neighbor was caught because they found fingers in the soup or the guy across the street was selling pet meat patties made out of people. During the siege of Leningrad, it lasted 900 days. They said the most terrifying thing to see coming toward you on the street was a beefy, well-fed man because any beefy, well-fed man in, in those days in Leningrad was probably eating human flesh. Shikatilo's father was a Soviet soldier who was captured by the Nazis during World War II and was placed in a prisoner of war camp. Shikatilo's interest in communism began at an early age, followed by 25 years as a Communist Party member. During his teenage years, Shikatilo didn't have much luck with the ladies, often rejected and experiencing embarrassing episodes of impotence. He became obsessed with masturbation. Shikatilo eventually moved to Russia to seek employment and earned his master's degree in Russian literature. He married and produced two children, despite his impotence. After losing interest in having sex with his wife, a few years later, Shikatilo would be charged with complaints of sexual misconduct and was fired from his job as a counselor. This early incident would indicate an interest in young girls and boys, not to mention disembowelment and mutilation. And a year later, he began to feed his ravenous bloodlust. The initial wounds on his victims would be uh, frequent and shallow, and in this, typically in this area, because at that point, Chikatilo would have had his victim on the ground and he would be on top of the victim, having immobilized the victim in some way. And those initial wounds would be wounds of establishing dominance, not wounds that were trying to um, inflict pain or damage. Shikatilo moved to Rostov where he worked as a teacher. Here a monstrous spree of slaughter followed, spanning 12 years and uncovering at least 53 gruesome murders, mostly young children. Living in Rostov, a port city 500 miles from Moscow, Shikatilo stalked and preyed on children and trained in bus stations. Shikatilo had much in common with those he preyed on as they too were social misfits and victims of rejection. Carrying a black leather medical bag, housing a knife and a rope, Shikatilo would lure his young victims with the promise of a meal or a ride, taking them into a secluded, heavily forested area. Shikatilo would then make a meal of his own, butchering his victims, removing their eyes, biting off their nipples, severing body parts, and devouring the genitals of many. Shikatilo would disembowel and mutilate his victims to gain a sense of power and control, which in turn further fueled his sexual desire. I think he stumbled into murder, and I, I think his, his, his original, his first killing was, in a sense, accidental and logical at the same time. It was accidental because he didn't bring the girl there to kill her. Um, in a certain sense, he was so unconscious 
from the force of his desire at that point that he didn't realize that he was going to have to kill her. But then when he was done with her, he, he, it was clear that he could not let her. He was sober again. He was satisfied. His lust had been satisfied. His mind had, had cleared, and he saw that he couldn't let the girl go. Suddenly he was a thinking being again. And therefore, as often happens in homicides, you got to kill her. That was his only choice, or take the consequence. So, that was the key moment in his, his whole life, and he chose to take a life. And he discovered, in the process of taking a life, that his greatest pleasure was, in fact, in ultimately taking everything from the person, their dignity, their peace, the inviolability of their body, and then ultimately their life. He was the great taker. And then at some point in that process, he discovered he was not only a child molester, not only a killer, but a cannibal. That came at some point down the line. But in fact, he made those choices that, and continually remade those choices. Although at a certain point, what's the difference? I mean, if, I mean, it's tough to repent after 44, you know, 44 killings. I mean, he even said at the end, you know, it's, this was even more horrifying than nearly anything that he said. He said, and you know, in the end, it was even starting to get a little bit routine. You know, it was kind of dull. You know, the bloom was off. It wasn't like back in the good old days when it was all fresh to me and I was excited, you know. It's hard to get excited about this stuff anymore, you know. Typically, serial killers uh, escalate their sadism, uh, their torturing. Uh, they may start uh, with just strangling a victim, but by the time they get to the fifth victim, they may be uh, uh, t you know, keeping uh, her uh, in a chair for days on end, uh, tying her up, torturing her, electrocuting her, uh, injecting cleaning fluid in her veins to see her convulse, doing all kinds of unspeakable things. And certainly at some point, the level of sadism increases so that uh, cannibalism becomes a viable option. Uh, it, it, it's kind of like a drug addict who needs larger and larger doses of the same drug in order to maintain that high. Well, serial killers get high on sadism and on torturing. And at some point, they're not satisfied any longer by the level of, of sadism achieved, and they turn to cannibalism. In all, Shikatilo cannibalized at least 36 victims. Suspected as a likely subject to the Mad Beast murders, Shikatilo was later released before questioning. The Soviet authorities were informed that Shikatilo was a Communist Party member. Therefore, he could not possibly be a murderer, let alone a serial murderer. The investigating powers eventually turned their attention towards the moral cleansing of homosexuals in Russia. While more and more bodies, mutilated, were discovered, as Shikatilo, the bloodthirsty madman, was still on the loose. Incredibly, authorities released Shikatilo a second time after a blood and semen test resulted in a negative match for Shikatilo's blood type. Free again, Shikatilo resumed his reign of terror until two Soviet investigators posted at a rural train station spotted Shikatilo emerging from the forest and immediately arrested him. At his 1994 trial, Shikatilo told the court how he would boil and eat the nipples and severed testicles of his victims. People in the courtroom fainted. The odd thing about Chikatilo was, even though he did admit to being a cannibal and eating or biting certain parts off of the body, he would never admit that he was eating the uterus of women. He would admit that he removed the uterus so skillfully, in fact, the police thought it had to be a surgeon for a while and they, that was doing the killings and they, they did background checks on thousands of surgeons, so he was quite skillful at that. And he would also admit that he would take the woman's uterus, which is a small pear-shaped organ, as it's traditionally described, and he would nibble it, okay? Because he, he liked its springiness. He liked the sort of its toothsomeness, okay? But eat it? No, I, I would never do anything of that sort. That, that was true. He would never admit to eating it. And yet it was clear that he was eating it, um, at least again by circumstantial evidence, because none was ever found in the vicinity of the crime when, when bodies were found reasonably fresh. Inspector Kostoyev never quite knew whether that was because even Chikatilo had a little sh some shame left in him, 
Or Chikatilo figured, okay, um, I'm going to admit to everything else, but I'm not going to admit to absolutely everything. I'm going to keep a little power in the situation. Here I can say no, they're not going to do anything to me for this. They're already, I'm, I'm a lost soul, but, but here I'll make a little stand. I'll give them a little trouble. I won't go like a sheep to the end. What I did was not for sexual pleasure. Rather, it brought me some peace of mind, Chikatilo told the court. A lot of the uh, wounds that Chikatilo inflicted were inflicted on the sexual parts of his victims. And it, it wasn't by accident. He was taking from them what he felt had been taken from him. In a certain sense, he was seeking justice. Little is known about the effects of eating human flesh. Some studies have revealed tribes ritualistically cannibalizing became struck with kuru, a disease of the brain, later named the laughing disease, causing hysterical laughter and crippling the sufferer with uncontrollable muscle spasms. It does strange things to the physiology. I mean, uh, Inspector Kostoyev told me, and it's in my book, Hunting the Devil, that there was terrible smells came from Chikatilo. Uh, they gradually disappeared. And then a Scottish doctor wrote me a letter explaining how the digestion of human flesh, the, we're not really set up for it. And uh, it produces something anyway, it, uh, some kind of terrible chemical stink that emanates through the pores and the skin of the person in question. Some studies have proven that in large quantities, human flesh provides significant protein, tasting similar to veal, pork, chicken, or even sirloin. Chikatilo had no preference. Chikatilo had a disease. I mean, it's the question of is Chikatilo sick or is he evil? I say he's both, and he's evil because he didn't take responsibility for his sickness. I mean, he knew always on some level that you don't just kill little children. I mean, he wasn't a stupid person. He knew, and he was very careful to not get caught and very successful in not being caught. Not only did Chikatilo express no remorse for killing his victims, he displayed no emotion for an innocent man convicted and executed for a murder Chikatilo committed in his earlier years. The urge that moved Chikatilo was clearly a very powerful urge because it broke through all social taboos. It was a mighty urge. And yet, when Chikatilo felt the cops were on his track, suddenly he had the willpower to desist from those urges, resist those urges for three years at a time. After Chikatilo had been convicted for 53 murders, he was executed. He was taken from his cell and traditionally, he would be forced to his knees then he would be executed by having a nine millimeter bullet shot through his brain from under his right ear. Just before they shot him, he screamed out, don't blow out my brains, the Japanese want to buy them. And those were Chikatilo's last words. And in fact, the Japanese did want to buy his brains, I believe, or at least there were rumors to the effect that someone from Japan wanted to buy him. His, brain. So his last words were, don't, sh don't blow up my brains, the Japanese want to buy them. Jeffrey Dahmer was born to a kind mother and a father who held a PhD in chemistry, but spent more time in the lab than at home with his family. From early on, Dahmer's macabre interest grew from an unhealthy obsession with roadkill to the torture and killing of small animals. Neighbors spoke of coming across frogs and cats nailed to the trees behind the Dahmer residence. As an adult, Dahmer was quiet and polite, working in a Milwaukee chocolate factory. But Dahmer's placid demeanor clearly belied the skeletons he had in his closet 
literally. Dahmer was a homosexual with tastes for alcohol, a very specific male body type and cannibalism. He would prowl local gay bars and lure men back to his apartment with the promise of drugs, drink, or sex. Dahmer, at 18, had already committed his first murder. I think the most surprising aspect about Dahmer was uh, his demeanor and his appearance. Uh, uh, he gave no indication at all that he was a violent individual. In a weird sense, he wasn't, because uh, one thing that he did indicate was that he did not like violence, he did not like uh, suffering, unlike some of the more organized serial killers, uh, John Wayne Gacy, for example, and Ted Bundy, who delighted in, in, in torturing and frightening their victims. Dahmer seemed to want to uh, eliminate their consciousness as soon as possible, either through drugs or asphyxiation. And by uh, uh, taking them out of a waking state, he could then inflict sexual uh, acts on them as he preferred to without, without being bothered by the, the communication of the individual and possibly the resistance. His original intention was to create a set of zombies, living zombies, with whom he could have sex. So he actually did frontal lobotomies and poured acid into their uh, skulls. Uh, when every single one of his victims died, he went to his backup plan and started to strangle victims uh, under sedation. Uh, not only did he sedate his victims, but he sedated himself. He was drinking very heavily. And certainly at the trial, he expressed his remorse, even when it was not in his interest to do so. Uh, so I would say, overall, Jeffrey Dahmer is quite uh, an enigma, quite an anomaly. Well, one of the few serial killers who was genuinely remorseful, who was not a sadistic guy at all, and yet committed the, about the most hideous acts you can think of. In one of the incidences, Dahmer had gotten a young man to come to his apartment with him. It was an Asian young man. I don't know that Dahmer knew how young he was. As I recall, he was 15 or so. Dahmer, as part of this bizarre idea, determined that he would make him a sex slave and actually attempted to drill into his skull. During this process, he rendered the man apparently unconscious. Dahmer went out to get alcohol. The young man apparently regained consciousness, wandered out naked onto the street where he encountered several citizens who called police. A police came as well as a fire truck and as they were gathered about this young naked man, along came Dahmer. Dahmer was able to persuade the police that it was a lover of his and the police walked Dahmer back to his apartment with this young man. Dahmer said he couldn't find his, his license, driver's license, but assured the police that it was a lover of his and that he was at least 18 years of age. The police uh, believed Dahmer and left the apartment. When that came to light, then Dahmer, of course, then proceeded to kill this young man. In the apartment building, neighbors began complaining about noxious odors and the recurring use of a power saw. Dahmer would later explain that the smells were meat in his refrigerator that had spoiled and that he was using the saw to build furniture. But what police found would tell a different story. Included amid the horrors discovered in Dahmer's apartment, three dissolved bodies in five and a half gallon acid vats, four severed heads, skeletons in the closet, a penis in a lobster pot, a male torso partially eaten away by acid. Dahmer's refrigerator contained no food, just condiments, but his freezer did contain human lungs, livers, intestines, kidneys, and skulls, and a heart that he said he was to eat later. Uh, Dahmer's direction with cannibalism was, was uh, a combination of uh, uh, perversity and uh, belief of, of possession of victims. He, he wanted to consume his victims to make them part of him. Uh, at the same time, he, he had talked in terms of the fact that consuming his victims would make him more powerful, would give him more uh, potential to uh, enter another level of existence. Uh, there seemed to be a sexual element also to Dahmer's uh, cannibalism and uh, uh, he would uh, prepare certain parts of the body in, in certain ways, uh, cooking the, the parts and then consuming them during acts of uh, masturbation and uh, in preparation for going out for another victim. So there was a sexual element also for Dahmer's cannibalism. For sadistic serial killers, the murder is a mere footnote to the torturing that is done to the victim. By contrast, Jeffrey Dahmer killed in order to maintain the relationship. He killed for company. 
he, the, the only relationship he seemed to be able to have because he felt so profoundly rejected by human beings was with corpses. Uh, and so he practiced necrophilia and cannibalism. And these were his attempts to kill for company, to maintain company, to keep his victims around so they couldn't leave the way that everyone else had always left him in the past. Dahmer is a tragic story of the impact of fantasy on the human mind. He didn't suddenly start killing people. He started with a fantasy about beating a man unconscious and having sex with him. He dwelt on that fancy, thought about it, thought about it, and the fancy moved from just that, a thought, to then a planning, and finally he undertook to do it. Jeffrey Dahmer approached him and asked him if he wanted to make some extra money. My brother went back with him to the apartment. He offered my brother a beer. He went to the refrigerator, opened up the beer, and put the sleeping portion in the beer and gave it to my brother. My, bro my brother drank the beer and passed out. While my brother was out, he was trying to do some type of experiment on him, where he drilled the hole in the temple of his head and poured some type of acid solution into the hole, trying to make him out of a zombie. It didn't work. He said my brother came to and said that he had a headache. so. He gave him some more sleeping portion and he, he was out again and that's when he did whatever he did to my brother. I said if he was one of the victims, I said, where's his body at? How did he identify him? He said, well, we put like 100 pictures in front of him and he pointed to the people he had murdered and your brother was one of them. So I said, uh, where's his body at? And I'll never forget the way he looked and he said, and like all the, all the deaths were gruesome, all of them, you know, but he said, uh, all I can tell you is that your brother's death was one of the most gruesome of them all. And I said, and I said, I know what I've been hearing for the last 12 days. What could be more gruesome than what I've already heard? Unlike Fish or Shikatilo, Dahmer did express remorse and sorrow for his monstrosities. His trial jury, however, was not feeling sympathetic. Dismissing his attorney's plea for insanity, the jury convicted Dahmer of 17 murders. He was sentenced to over 900 years in prison. Before the trial, the families were asked to identify their loved ones. Mr. McCann took us all in a room, all the families, and he went down each family and told us what he did. Not really, really into detail, but just kind of like more or less generalization of what he did. And um, that's when I discovered he had cut off Eddie's head and put it in a closet for three days he decided what he wanted to do with it. And then he decided to bake it. And I was told this just before we went to trial. So I have this on my mind, and then he tells us not to show no emotion, no outburst, no crying. I mean, my brother's head in the closet for three days, and someone's gonna decide what to do with him. He already decided to take his life. I had no idea they was gonna allow us to make a statement. And I was so anxious, so they made me laugh. I had no idea I was going to react the way I did. Because if I had a thought about it, I would have, wouldn't have said a word, just jumped up and grabbed them. But it wouldn't have done any good. And they had already told us that if we had made any outbursts, that they would call a retrial. And I just didn't want to sit through that again. Jeffrey, I hate you! For me, I got sick afterwards. I mean, they had to escort me out of there and give me some medication. I had, to, had such a serious headache. Uh, I had that boggled up inside of me for so long, and for the longest, I had never seen that man in person, and chills just went through me when I did see him. And for him to sit there like a zombie, uh, 
after the way I acted, that really got next to me too. Dahmer confessed to all murders in a 159-page document and would later apologize to the families in his final statement. It was the longest confession I've ever heard of in my life. It was 159 pages. I know it's complete because everything that Dahmer told the authorities was true. It had all been checked out. I thought Jeffrey Dahmer might do well to make a statement the world wanted to hear from him. I thought the content was appropriate. They were his thoughts. It was an honest, heartfelt statement made by Jeffrey Dahmer. I feel so bad for what I did to those poor families, and I understand their rightful hate. I should have stayed with God. I tried and failed and created a holocaust. In 1994, in a ghoulishly ironic twist, Dahmer met his demise while actually cleaning house. While mopping the floor with fellow inmate and convicted murderer Christopher Scarver, Dahmer was bludgeoned to death. Authorities found the Milwaukee monster dead on the dial. Jeffrey Dahmer in that Wisconsin penitentiary actually got more mail than all of the other inmates combined. And you know, there are a lot of inmates who would like to say something to the public. They, they want some sympathy. They, they feel, for example, that they're innocent and they're looking for uh, some kind of assistance or advice. Well, they, they can't get it when, when they've got the celebrity of the year among them. Uh, so there's a lot of hatred in prisons that's directed against people like Jeffrey Dahmer who get so much publicity and become big shot celebrities. Following Dahmer's death, his mother requested that his brain be preserved in formaldehyde for the purposes of future study. But Dahmer's father wanted to honor his son's wish to be cremated. A court battle ensued, with the judge eventually ruling in favor of Mr. Dahmer. If I had access to Jeff Dahmer when he was, a, say, a pre-adolescent and uh, uh, observed some of the things that he was doing, the uh, taking of roadkill from the side of the road, taking it to his garage, dismantling uh, dead animals, uh, taking their bones, cleaning their bones up with acid, and uh, his infatuation with uh, uh, dead animals. I mean, I, I definitely would have had, had a clue that there was something really amiss here. And of course, you could have carried that on to other elements of his life that, that would indicate that he was on a, a track, a road map, that would take him to violent offenses later on in life. The only mystery would be what Dahmer was like the five minutes before he started his killings. I fully think that if he had a video camera on him, you would have seen somebody acting much like the fellow did in Silence of the Lambs, where he started making noises and acting out of body and jumping around as if he was a banshee. I think that Dahmer got into that mode Dahmer never reported it out. Dahmer never made a statement to help him in his insanity plea. Dahmer never lied about hearing voices or having hallucinations. He was as honest a client as I've ever represented as far as telling you about the crime he committed. But Dahmer was never able to tell me how he was just five or ten minutes before the killings took place. I think he was psychotic. And the last fellow that was with Dahmer who got away from him, who was the one that contacted the police, shared with me that concept that when he was with Dahmer, right when he thought he was going to be hurt and harmed, Dahmer started uh, making noises and acting very, very strange. So I think the mystery is, how was he? We'll never know. Dahmer never told us. We never saw any of the witnesses. There's no recordings of any kind of it. So that's the only mystery. Other than that, there is no mystery. Some of the acts that are done, the acts entailing uh, cannibalism, the acts entailing vampirism, those in, entailing necrophilia and mutilation of bodies, things of that nature on a compulsive basis, uh, sometimes it just appears to me that uh, uh, there, there's got to be another element that uh, science does not readily recognize, and that's the concept of evil. Uh, some of these behavior patterns come straight from hell. It's quite normal to have aggressive thoughts that you don't translate into aggressive, nasty, dangerous, murderous behavior. But serial killers tend to start early with a rich fantasy life in which they fuse together sex and violence. And because they can't communicate these fantasies to other people, they're pretty much left on their own to fantasize over a long period of time and these fantasies increase in complexity and frequency. By the time they start to kill, they're really chasing their dreams. They are 
attempting to perfect what they've been fantasizing about through their lives. And because that's impossible, because they can never achieve that kind of perfection, they continue to kill, always with the hope that they'll do it better the next time, that it'll be the perfect killing. How these three apparently mild-mannered men, painter, teacher, and factory worker, could go on to commit the most gruesome and unspeakable acts in criminal history is a question that may forever go unanswered. After all, truth is stranger than fiction. I think the, you know, the whole thing with cannibalism that fascinates us when it is committed by people like Albert Fish or in fiction by somebody like Hannibal Lecter is not so much how evil it is because, you know, in a way it's arguable how evil it is to eat a portion of flesh of somebody who's just tortured and killed horribly, or, or what is more evil, do you know what I mean? You know, the victim is already dead. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, eating the liver of the person uh, is not necessarily more evil than having killed the person to begin with. It could be argued that cannibalism, as this ultimate form of aggression, lurks within every one of us. Not to say that we are going to literally devour our enemy or our opponent, but only that we have a, an aggressive part of ourselves. It's part of basic human nature. And it, to that extent, we are all potential cannibals. Images on the silver screen will continue to bring fiction to life and turn fiction into reality. The character of Hannibal Lecter the fictional cannibal taps into something in all of us, something which fascinates, horrifies, and ultimately bewilders us, the mind of the serial killer. But Hannibal Lecter and his real-life cannibal friends are out there, walking amongst us. Sadly enough, we may have to live for some time with the fact that we really don't understand where serial murder comes from. After all, we've only been studying it for about 20 years. It is a rare phenomenon, but it's such an enigmatic phenomenon. It's the type of thing that you can con conduct training uh, to everybody on how to behave when you're uh, approached by a serial killer, and it's just not going not to help you one bit. So it's, uh, it's a fact of life. It's like an auto accident. It's like... Uh, uh, a strike of lightning out of the out of the sky. It's something that uh, is very unlikely to happen to you, but if it does, it's all over.